so it's okay. Let's pray. Lord, uh, tonight as we uh, do look at this section and uh, God, as we just think about the circumstances surrounding uh, the passages that we're going to read and Lord, what was going on in the world at that time and, and God, I thank you for recording this, for giving us uh, your view of the situation versus man's view and, and for giving us the, the prophet to speak, Lord, into situations. And, and God, I pray that as we hear him speak to that genera- generation, God, it would do something in our hearts. And Lord, we do want to walk with you. We want to follow you. We want to love you. We want to honor you. And Lord, we want to glorify you. And so tonight as we, as we study and as we read, just, Lord, grab our hearts in your hand and, and do that molding process, that shaping that only you can do. And God, we thank you for your word. Thank you for tonight to be able to gather with brothers and sisters. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, if you guys remember last week, we did look at 2 Kings 16 and 2 Chronicles 28. Remember, we combined those, and we had King Ahaz and how messed up that guy was. I mean, you, you know, you talk, about, you talk about a guy determined to do evil. And I had said we combined those two, and I said I wish we could really combine Isaiah 7 and 8 along with that, but we'd be here for several hours. So we kind of keep that study in mind if you can or those passages. And then think about tonight. And tonight we're going to look at Isaiah and Isaiah speaking to Ahaz in particular, but also to that generation in Judah of what's going on. And as we think about it, here's the thing. Man, Ahaz was a compromiser. Remember, remember he went and got the, even the plans from another temple and brought it in to build or for, of an altar and brought it in to build at the temple. So crazy stuff going on. And Isaiah's going to confront him. And, you know, something that, that kind of hit my heart as I looked at this is sometimes, listen, sometimes when we trust the world more than we trust God, the bad part about that is we may get more of the world than we bargained for. And that's what we're kind of watching with Ahaz. Listen, he's refusing to believe God. He's using Isaiah. God is using Isaiah to scream at him, I got this. Don't worry about it. Everything's going to be okay. I've got this handled. And something to keep in mind as we go through this is God had promised to bring the Messiah through the line of David, right? Right? So kind of keep that in mind because Ahaz, whether we like it or not and whether we like him or not, is in that lineage. And God is going to keep his promise. But Ahaz is much like us. It's easier to walk by sight than by faith, right? You know, it's, it's hard to trust God, man. And it's hard, especially when our circumstances seem so opposite of the promises of God, it's really hard to trust him, especially even when we have people like screaming in our ear, you're gonna be fine, it's gonna be okay, God keeps his promises, and then we kind of look at the sermon, no, I'd rather walk by sight, you know, and I'd rather trust Assyria, we're gonna see Ahaz doing that, but the same thing goes for us, we're trying it in our own strength, so kind of keep those things in mind as we're working through this and looking at this, and to kind of, again, keep in mind the whole worldwide circumstance. You have Assyria who's building up this huge, huge, huge power of the world, not just of the Middle East, but of the world. Israel and Syria, remember they came against Ahaz? But they came against Ahaz because Ahaz wouldn't join with them to go against Assyria. So they're joining forces. We're going to see, and we saw last time, they joined forces to come against him. And remember in Kings it says they didn't succeed, and in Chronicles we read of all the people they took away. Well, tonight we're going to find out what that word success meant to, meant to Syria and Israel. But they're kind of coming against him because he wouldn't join with them. So here's his dilemma. God says, I got your back, but it doesn't feel like it. They got these huge war machines coming at you, and now they've joined forces. Listen, Judah had fended off Syria, and they had fended off Israel, but they hadn't fended them off together. And now they've joined forces, and they're coming. You're scared. 
And you know, the things I find in my life is when I get scared is that's the hardest time to trust God, right? That's the hardest time to say, okay, God, I know, I know it's going to be okay. So having all of that, we'll get a little bit of background real quick in, in verses 1 and 2 of chapter 7. It says, now it came to pass in the days of Ahaz, the son of Jotham, the son of Uzziah, king of Judah, that Rezin, king of Syria, and uh, Pekah, the, king of, uh, the son of Ramaliah, king of Israel went up to Jerusalem to make war against it, but could not prevail against it. And once again, they're coming against him because he wouldn't join with them. And then listen, it was told to the house of David saying, serious forces are deployed in Ephraim. So his heart and the heart of the people were moved as the trees of the woods are moved with the wind. So here's what he's saying. They're scared out of their minds. Right? You see that coming at you, and we see our circumstances and situations, and sometimes we begin to look at the circumstance or the situation, and we forget all about the promises of God. And, you know, I, I don't believe Ahaz, I don't believe he's much different than us. We can get mad at him, and we can look at him and make fun of him and say you shouldn't do that, but I don't think he's a lot different than most of us in this room, where, man, when we, we get freaked out, it's hard to trust God, isn't it? It's sort of easy to trust him when everything's going smooth. But when everything's coming at you, it's like, and especially I think maybe, maybe a little bit more so guys, because guys want to fix things, guys want to take care of things, and you know what? I can take these guys out. All I need is a little help. So here's the deal. What are you going to do, Ahaz? Are you going to trust what Isaiah says, or are you going to trust in the, and I did read ahead, and I did read last week. He's already, listen, he's already made a deal with Assyria. He's not coming forth and he's not letting everybody know. So listen, Isaiah says, I, I love this in verse 3. Then the Lord said to Isaiah, go out to meet Ahaz, you and Shear Je, uh, Jeshub, kind of a strange name, that's his, your son, at the end of the aqueduct from the upper pool on the highway to the fuller's field. So here's what he's saying. You and your son, you go check out and you go, you go, uh, to the aqueduct because the king's going to be there. Here's what's going on. He's checking his water supply to see if he has enough resources to kind of hold off what's going on. So he's out there, and here's what God says. He sends the prophet right at the time where they can be alone. He can talk to him. And he sends his son, and his son's name basically means a remnant shall return. That's kind of cool, isn't it? Later on, Isaiah's going to say, I'm a sign, my sons are signed. We're going to read, he named his sons weird names. But listen, and, he, and he's got this guy with him, and here's what his son is, is like blasting to, to Ahaz. The remnant will return, the remnant will return. It's going to be, so he's got, and I'm thinking he's a little guy. Maybe he was, you know, I don't know how old, but anyway, they're hanging out. And they go and they talk to him, and then Isaiah approaches him. So he says, go, go there and say to him, take heed and be quiet. That's Bible talk for chill out, right? Ahaz, chill out. Take a breath, man. Like, dial it back a little bit. Step back from the situation. And you kind of like it, right? Because here's the thing that, that's like, like speaking to my heart. Like, Isaiah's going and giving him everything, and he ain't listening. You know, nothing, nothing is harder than to be talking to people who could care less and people who aren't listening, unlike you guys. You know, it's, it's great. Uh, listen, I think of that, and I think, poor, poor Isaiah, man. So listen, he says, dial it back a little bit. And listen, do not, be, do not fear or be faint-hearted for these two stubs of smoking firebrands, for the fierce anger of Re Rezin and, and Syria and the son of Ramaliah, because Syria, Ephraim, and the son of Ramaliah have plotted evil against you, saying, let us go up against Judah and trouble it, and let us make a gap in its wall for ourselves and set a king over them, the son of Tabel. Oh, you see their whole plan when they came down is they wanted to set up a king. And remember last week when we looked at it in Kings, it said they failed. But in Chronicles, remember, they had killed 150,000. They had taken, and then they'd killed his main three guys, and then they'd taken 250,000 captive. I mean, that's huge losses in any war. I don't care who you are. And you think, how did they fail? Well, they wanted to take the throne. So they came down to do that, and God said, don't you love what, listen, here's, here's Ahaz looking at him going, ah! You know, look at these guys. Look at this war machine coming at me. Here's what God says. 
They're like cigarette butts, man. They are not a problem, right? God's looking at them and goes, this guy's not in there smoking fire brand. You know, just step on it and put it out and let's move on. They're nothing. And you and I kind of do the same thing, don't we? We look at this problem and it seems insurmountable. And the Lord says, I got this. It's nothing to me. It's just like, just like, just smoldering over there. It's not a problem. Why are you afraid of them? And here's what they said. Let's do this. Verse seven, thus says the Lord God, it shall not stand, nor shall it come to pass, for the head of Syria is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is, is a resin. With six, within 65 years, Ephraim will be broken, so, that there, uh, so it will not be a people. The head of Ephraim is Samaria, and the head of Samaria is Ramaliah's son. Now let's just kind of stop there, because here's what God says. Man, these guys are going to disappear. You don't have to worry about them. I've got your back. I've got this. There's no way they're going to do that. Why? Because you're part of the messianic line, I'm not gonna let that disappear. I'm God, it's not gonna happen. So you need to trust me, you need to know, and, and again, you know, get, get yourself a Bible chart. Within 65 years, he's saying, he's saying the northern 10 tribes are gonna be gone, and they were within 65 years. He says, you're not even gonna have to worry about Syria, I'm just gonna crush them like a little toad. Don't get so freaked out. So he said, listen, I, it's gonna be okay, but look at this last part because this is true for us. If you will not believe, surely you shall not be established. Now listen, God is saying, if you don't believe, all of my plans are gonna fall apart. Here's what he's saying. If you don't believe, you're gonna go through this thing kicking and screaming, right? Hey, if you don't trust me, you're gonna go through it because you're gonna go through it either way. You can go through it trusting me and have peace in your heart and know that I've got the situation under control or you can go through this kicking and screaming. It's your choice. You're not gonna be established and isn't that something you and I maybe need to write on a refrigerator, right? When we think about our lives and we think about what's going on and the situations, man, listen, we can go through it unestablished, not firm, wondering what's going to happen. Oh, no. You know, it's kind of like even going through this political season, and we'll get into that in a little bit. Listen, God says, you forget who's in control. Like, don't freak out. And so... He gives all of this to Ahaz, and, and here's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking, you know, I'm thinking as he's speaking to Ahaz, I'm thinking Ahaz is kind of rolling his eyes. Yeah, sure. And maybe Ahaz is even thinking, you haven't walked through what I've walked through, dude. You're like a prophet, and you got this kid, and you got things going on, and your life looks pretty, you know, pretty nice, and I've got to face all this. I'm responsible for all these people, and you don't even know what's going on. Plus, I don't really believe in God anyway. I got my own thing going on. Now, why would I trust him? You see, the strange thing is you can't trust someone you don't believe or you don't believe in. And here's what I love. Listen, I kind of think he's shooting that attitude. And God, God is so good, he ain't gonna give up on this guy. It's like, you know, it's like there's just a little bit of flame of God in him. And God's going, man, we gotta, we gotta get that going, right? So listen, it says, verse 10, moreover, the Lord spoke again to Ahaz, saying, come on, Ahaz, come on, man, we can do this together, right? Isn't that what the Lord's saying? Don't you love the idea Pastor Rob prayed that we get second chances, third chances, fourth chances, five chances, fifth chance, all, all, you know. And here's God looking at Ahaz. And uh, the rest of us are looking at Ahaz saying, what a dork. And God's going, no, man, we gotta get this going, come on. And he, listen, he comes to Ahaz, and, and here's what he says. Hey, Ahaz, verse 11. Hey, Ahaz, ask for a sign uh, for yourself from the Lord your God. Ask either in the depth or in the height above. Now, this is kind of crazy, because usually, you know, usually the Bible says you shouldn't be doing that. And here's what God's going to this king, and he's going, listen, I know, here's, here's the way I interpret this. I know you don't trust me. I know you don't even believe in me. I know you're doing a high place thing. I know you got your own altar going on. I know you've given up on me, but here's the deal, dude. Ask for a sign. Just ask me. Man, I wish God would give me that. Just ask for a sign. And God says, I don't care how high it is. I don't care how deep it is. Ask for a sign and I'll do it. And Ahaz, being the very righteous guy that he is, or hypocrite, 
Listen, but Ahaz said in verse 12, I will not ask, nor will I test the Lord, because I am so holy. Puke. Right? He's kind of coming out of Deuteronomy chapter 6. He's kind of playing games with, you know, hey, here's what I think. He doesn't want to ask for a sign because he doesn't want to get the sign because he doesn't want to have to follow what the sign's going to imply. In other words, he doesn't want to have to, he doesn't want to follow God. And check it out, he's already made the deal with Assyria. He's already in their pocket and they're going to come and they're going to abuse him so much because he made a deal with the world. And again, we're seeking a world, man. The downfall of that is you're going to get more of the world than you ever, ever bargained for. So he's already done it. So he's acting all spiritual. Well, no, I'm not going to ask the Lord. I'm not going to test God. So <laughs> here's what I love. This is verse 13. Then the Lord said to him, Hear now, O house of David. Oh, notice who we're talking to. Kind of important, right? House of David. It's where the Messiah is coming from. Is it a small thing for you to weary men? It is a small thing for you to weary men, but will you weary my God also? Oh, here's what Isaiah is saying. Dude, you just, you're in for it. You're going to the woodshed. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Here's what I love. God says, you know what? Okay, now here's the thing. You ask for a sign, you get to choose. When you choose any sign, I'll give it to you. But now that I'm given a sign, I'm going to choose and here's my feeling about what's go- about to happen. God is going to give him a sign that he can't understand. Why? Because he chose not to trust God. And God's saying, okay, man, I'm going to give you this sign, and it's pretty wonderful. As a matter of fact, they're going to quote this about 700 years from now. It's pretty cool what's going down. And listen, but you are going to go, What? So God gives him a sign, right? And most of us know this scripture that's coming, right? Therefore the Lord will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and and shall call his name Emmanuel. Curds and honey he shall eat that he may know how to refuse, that he may know to refuse the, the evil and choose good. For before the child shall know to refuse evil and choose good, the land that you dread will be forsaken by both her kings. So here's what he's saying. I'll give you a sign. And then he gives the prophecy about the Messiah, about Jesus Christ. You know, it's interesting. You read this, and I, I, I don't know if you guys, you know how much studying you've done. Most, most liberal scholars say, well, you, you need to know, especially in Isaiah 14, that word for virgin is a word that means, you know, just a young lady. You know, and, and, and people like really hammer that. Number one, what kind of sign is that a young lady will be pregnant? I mean, if you said that today, here's a sign for you, a young woman's gonna get pregnant. Whoa, that's deep. Like it's happening all the time, right? And when this particular word is used, it's speaking of a young single woman. And a young single woman in the context of that culture is a virgin. And it just bugs me when I hear liberal people. He's not saying, he's not really talking about a virgin. Oh, he so is, because that's the mystery of what's going on. And so then, listen, now other people say, okay, now this is a sign to Isaiah. So they kind of buy into that, and they go, so a virgin is going to be with child, and here's how they explain it. The virgin will, she's a virgin as he's speaking, but then she's going to get married, and then she's going to be with child. Once again, what kind of sign is that? How many virgins do you think that year got married and got pregnant? Probably lots, right? You guys are looking at me blank. I think lots. I mean, life goes on, right? And I'm thinking, that's not, that's not like a mystery. And then others say, oh, no, it's talking about Isaiah. And in the next chapter, we're going to see he, him and his wife have another son. And they're going, no, it's Isaiah's second son from his second wife because his first wife died. How do we know his first wife died? Well, because I decided. Because I really can't like make this fit, and so I gotta make it fit. And then here's the whole thing. Skip over just for a moment. Skip over to, uh, to uh, verse three. It says, then I went to the, pro- of, of chapter eight. Then I went to the prophetess. She conceived and bore a son. Then the Lord said to me, call his name Meher Shalal Hashbaz slash Emmanuel. No, it doesn't say that, does it? 
Listen, God gives his son an entirely different name and it, over here in 14 and 15, or 14 it says, and you shall call his name what? Emmanuel, it doesn't have anything about mashed potato guy over in the other place. <laughs> it doesn't even have that. Listen, and I'm thinking, and I read people and I just go, ah, here's what I believe. I believe he's specifically, obviously talking about Jesus because listen, Matthew, Matthew quotes the scripture in Matthew chapter one. And I think he's talking about the virgin birth of Jesus. Now people go, but what kind of sign was that to Ahaz? It was a sign Ahaz could not understand. And here's what you need to know when he says he's gonna grow up eating curds and, and honey, that's, that's, a, that's a poverty thing. And we know that Jesus' family was not wealthy, right? It's kind of a common thing and they're a common family. And then it says, listen, and then it says, hey, before, before he can choose good or evil, in other words, when he's a little guy, young guy, these two kings are gonna die. I guarantee you those two kings died before Jesus knew good or evil. And some people are going, but it was 700 years later. What difference does it make? It says before he knows good or evil, well there's three years or 700 years. And again, I think the whole purpose here is Ahaz, you will never figure this out because I'm giving you a sign. So he lets him know that's what's gonna happen, but the point of what he's saying to Ahaz is this. Those two kings are going to die. Hmm. They're not going to get you. They're not going to win. Do not make a deal with Assyria, man. You make a deal with Assyria, it's going to bite you. It's going to be really, 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 really bad. It's going to be horrible. You don't want to do that, Ahaz. And I think the whole time, listen, I think the whole time Ahaz is going, I uh, already made that deal, and I'm not sure I can go back on it because they're really mean people. You know, the Assyrians, go back and study what they were doing, man. They would, they would go into villages. They would decapitate people. They'd put their heads on poles in front of the, in front of the vill village walls. They would cut open pregnant women. These guys were some mean, mean dudes, and he's made a deal with them. So the Lord says, okay, here's your sign. And then he says, listen, verse 17, the Lord will bring the king of Assyria upon you and your people and your father's house Days that have not come, uh, come since the day that Ephraim departed from Judah. So here's what the Lord just told him in verse 17. I already know you made a deal with Assyria. And since you made a deal with the world, the world's gonna come at you. And the world's gonna come at you with such a, uh, such a vengeance that it's gonna hurt so bad. And we read about that again in, in, in Chronicles last time. Verse 18, and it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord will whistle for the fly that is in the farthest part of the rivers of Egypt and for the bee that is in the land of Assyria and they will come and all of them will rest in the desolate valleys and in the clefts of the rocks and on the thorns and in all the pastures. Here's what he's saying, man. This place is gonna look gnarly when I get done with it. In the same day, verse 20, the Lord will shave with a hired razor, with those from beyond the river, with the king of Assyria, the head and the hair of the legs, and will also remove the beard. Here's what he's saying, man. We're gonna come in. When Assyria comes, they're gonna disgrace you. It's gonna be horrible, Ahaz. It shall be in that day that a man will keep alive, in verse 21, a young cow and two sheep, so it will be from the abundance of the milk that they give that he will eat curds. For curds and honey, everyone will eat who is left in the land. Again, just a really, really poor diet. Something that, that you know, just the, the poverty of, of the people would eat. And it shall happen in that day that wherever there could be a thousand vines worth a thousand shekels of silver, it will be for briars and thorns and with arrows and bows. Men will come there because all the land will become briars and thorns. And to any hill which could be dug with the hoe, you will not go there for fear of the briars and the thorns. And it will become a rage for oxen and a place for sheep to roam. Here's what I'm thinking. I hear chapter seven. I'm thinking, man, I'm gonna be on my face begging for mercy, right? I mean, that doesn't sound good. That doesn't sound like a good scenario. 
And yet it seems like Ahaz just keeps pushing and pushing and, and refusing and I don't want to hear. And you know, again, sometimes I'm so caught up with the circumstance that I don't care what God says because surely he can't be trusted because if God could be trusted, I wouldn't be in this circumstance. And so he's like pushing again. So again, chapter eight, verse one says, moreover, the Lord said to me, take a large scroll and write on it with a man's pen concerning Maher Shalal Hashbaz. And listen, and, and, and that whole name means speed for spoil and hasten to the booty. That's kind of a weird name, right? In other words, here's what's happening, man. This is what the people are gonna be shouting when they come in your country. And, and here's what he's telling him. I want you to get a scroll, a large scroll. Here's what he's saying. Get a big whiteboard where everybody can see it and begin to write this stuff out because here's the thing. Not just the king is not listening to him. No one's listening to him. What a drag. What a drag to be a spokesman for God and no one's listening you know, we were, in the, we were in the worship room. I was praying. Thank God, you know, I feel blessed. I get to, you know, be part of a, a ministry where people want to come, they want to hear, they want to listen, they want to do things. What a drag it would be if you guys were all like on your phones texting, you know, and not paying attention and kind of looking around and picking your noses and doing things like that and not even caring. And, it would just like, and so no one's listening to them. They don't care. No one cares. Can you imagine knowing That destruction is like knocking at the door and you're yelling, it's coming, it's coming. Everybody's going, nah, man, we got Assyria. We put our trust in the world, you know, this God thing, man, that's kind of old, Isaiah. Kind of, you know, you're kind of backwards, dude. We don't need that Bible stuff. We got Assyria. We're gonna be fine. It's gonna be okay. Can't you kind of hear the, and in the back, Everybody talks, it's going to be all right. He says, man, you need to take a whiteboard and you need to put in big, big letters your son's name, who isn't born yet, the mashed potato guy. (laughs) Quick to the spoil and, you know, speed to the booty or whatever it is. And it's like they're going to come in and they're going to be doing that. Verse two, and I will take for myself faithful witnesses to record Uriah the priest. You know, every time I read, I gotta tell you guys, I read verse two of chapter eight, and I remember this priest guy. You guys remember him last week? Last week he wasn't Uriah, he was called Uriah. Remember he had a J in there? I think it's the same dude. Remember what he did? He went and built that, he went and built that false altar for for remember, Ahaz sent him the plans and said, build this. It's got to be the same priest. It's a, it's a priest. And I'm thinking now he's a faithful witness. Listen, we can be a witness by doing the wrong thing. We can be a witness that God can use by showing everybody what a dork we are, kind of, I, you know, just put it in plain terms. We can be a witness. You can either be that good witness for God and, and testimony and bringing him glory, or you can be the witness, a bad witness, and he's still going to get the glory. You're just going to look bad. So I'm thinking, man, he's bringing these guys out. And he says, listen, these two guys and and then this other guy in Zechariah, the son of that guy, Jerry. He says, then I went to the prophetess. I think the prophetess is his wife. And I don't think it's his second wife. I think it's his wife. He says, I went to the prophetess. She conceived and she bore a son. Then the Lord said, call his name Mahir Shalal Hashbaz. For before the child shall have knowledge and uh, shall have knowledge to cry, my father and my mother, the riches of Damascus and the spoil of Samaria will be taken away before the king of Assyria. Here's what he's letting him, letting him know. He goes, man, Isaiah's telling the, the world, if you will, all of Israel who he's ministering to, before my little guy that was just born, before he can say daddy or mommy, you guys are going to be history. Or Syria and, and uh, Israel are going to be history. And Isaiah is saying, why wouldn't we trust God? And here's the crazy thing. You know what happened? Syria and Israel were history because Assyria came down, because they has hired them, and so the Lord says, you know, because you're insisting on doing the world thing, then I'm just going to bring the world on into you, and I'm going to let them happen, and they're going to be taken away before the king of Assyria. So verse 5, here's your consequences, Ahaz. 
The Lord also spoke to me again, saying, inasmuch as these people refuse the waters of Shiloh that flow softly, here's what he's saying, instead of like trusting God and going the gentle way, man, you are gonna get a flood and you're gonna get some raging water, I kinda love it. But first of all, they're rejoicing in Rezin and Ramallah's sons. Here's what, they're, here's what he's saying, Ramaliah's son, he's saying, listen, you're rejoicing in what happened to them, Oh, what happened to them is going to be going on in your own city. Why? Because you didn't trust me. Here's the thing I found with the Lord. He's faithful to keep his promise. He keeps his promises that are good to us, and he keeps his promises that are consequences to our bad decisions and bad behavior. But he's always faithful to keep his promises. So he says, listen, because you're that, now therefore, behold, the Lord brings up over them the waters of the river, strong and mighty, the king of Assyria and all his glory. He will go up over the channels and over the banks. Now listen, he's just using metaphors, talking about how they're gonna just, you know, come in as a flood. And he says, listen, and he will pass through Judah. He will overflow and pass over. He will reach up to the neck and stretching out his wings, he, you know, he will, will fill the breadth of your land. Oh, check this out. O oh, Emmanuel. There's a little bit of sarcasm. Here's what he's saying. This is going to happen with you, O oh, God with us. Because you see, God with us can be a really powerful, comforting thing, or God with us in judgment can be a really terrifying thing, right? Depending on what you're doing. Hey, when we're walking with God and we're praying and we're, you know, we're, we're you know, quote, in the spirit and doing this thing, we're going, oh God, I want your presence. When we're sinning, we so don't want him around but he's there. And I kind of like this idea. He's going, here's what's going to happen, Judah. All of this is going to come upon you, oh, God with us. And it's like, ay, ay, ay. Because God is going to be with them, but he's judging them. And he's bringing it. And then he, he kind of closes this section. He says, listen, be shattered, oh, you people and be broken to pieces. Give ear, all you from far countries. Gird yourselves but be broken in places. Listen, God's even calling out to other countries. Gird yourselves, but be broken in pieces. Take counsel together. That always works, right? Take counsel together, but it will come to nothing. Doesn't it always work to get in a huddle and talk things over? How many conversations politically have you had this week? <laughs> it's coming to nothing, isn't it? Maybe we should just trust God for this election, huh? He's got, a, you know, God's in control. Sometimes I wonder, but he's in control. I'm reading Isaiah, and I, you know, I, I know. So listen, listen, he's saying, you take counsel, and then he goes, speak the word, but it will not stand. Oh, yeah, for God is with us. A little bit of sarcasm. Now, here's what I love. You see, it's over, but it's not completely over. What was the name of his first kid? What was, it? What was that first guy's name? Jerry something? Do you guys remember what his name was? Shair Jashub? That's a hard name, huh? Shear Jashub. What did it mean? The remnant will return? You see, here's the glorious thing about God in the midst of all of this, man. There's that little remnant someplace there in Jerusalem, and God knows that remnant's there. So listen, now he's gonna kinda, kinda build on that a little bit. For the Lord spoke thus to me, verse 11, with a strong hand and instructed me that I should not walk in the way of the people, saying, here's, here's what the Lord's saying to Isaiah. Man, don't cave, bro. Can you imagine being Isaiah, looking at those people again, telling everybody, and they're going, or whatever they're doing, and here's what God's saying. Listen, because he knows. He's going, Isaiah, man, hang in there. Hang in there. And I say, I so don't want to do this. And I'm thinking, dude, you're only in chapter 7. You got to go to chapter 66, man. <laughs> you're just starting. And God's saying, hang in there. It's going to be okay, man. I got you. Listen, I kind of love that, don't you? He goes, man, he goes, whatever you do, don't cave. Verse 12, do not say a conspiracy concerning all that this people call a conspiracy, nor be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled. Listen, don't get so caught up in what they're doing. Again, maybe for us, don't get so caught up in all of the, all of the political pundits and all of that's going on. Don't ever forget who's in control. Don't get caught up in that. Verse 13, the Lord of hosts, him you shall hallow. 
or honor. Let him be your fear and let him be your dread. Listen, get your eyes off of that. Isaiah, right now, come on. And I think he's looking. Come on, Isaiah, come on, come on, come on, come on. Man, don't cave. Those guys are like, they're tugging on Isaiah. And God's saying, no, man, you hang on. Come on, look at me, look at me, look at me. You know, the thing is, man, when you fear God, you will never be afraid of any man. Because God. But when you fear man, you're in some serious trouble. He says, come on, man, just come on, I'm with you. I got this. It's okay. It's good for you. Man, and I'm reading this, and I'm going, yes, I kind of needed that in my own life. Verse 14, he will be a sanctuary. Oh, but a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense to both the houses of Israel. Peter kind of quoted that, right? Didn't Peter kind of let us know that same thing's going on? Listen, Jesus is going to come. It's going to, and isn't that the way God is? God can be such a sanctuary and such a safe place and simultaneously be on other people, right? And I kind of love that. So listen, he says, he says, man, he's going to be a sanctuary, but a stumbling stone, or a stone of stumbling, a rock of offense to both the houses of Israel as a trap and a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And many among them shall stumble, and they shall fall and be broken and be snared and taken. Wow, okay, thank you, Lord. In other words, here's what God's saying. Man, everything you're doing is just not gonna work. Wouldn't it be a bummer to know ahead of time that God has called you to bring this powerful message that he's stuck in you and you're going to go and you're going to give this message and God's saying, yeah, but it ain't going to do any good. Go have fun. I don't want to be a minister. I don't want to do that. He says, man, you know what? It's just going to like, man, these guys are going to be in their own way and they're going to be bound up. And then listen, here's what I love. Bind up the testimony. Do you hear what he's saying? Isaiah, get a hold of the word, man, and tie it tight. Bind it up and seal it, make it safe. Seal the law among my, my disciples. Oh, what's this kid's name? What's Jerry's name mean? The remnant shall return. Come on, Isaiah. There's some, there's some that this is gonna work and we gotta take the truth and we gotta hang on to it and we gotta not let go of it. And he says, listen, and, I, and he says, verse 17, and I will wait on the Lord who hides his face from the house of Jacob, and I will hope in him. Man, here's what I'm thinking, man. Isaiah's going, I don't got nothing else. All I got's God. You know, you find out Jesus is all you need when Jesus is all you have. And it's sad that we have to get to that place. So listen, and then he says, here, here am I, and the children whom the Lord has given me. Listen, this is kind of crazy. Here's what Isaiah is saying. Here I am, man, and I'm the one, I, and, and uh, the children the Lord has given me. Who's Isaiah? What does Isaiah mean? Yahweh saves. And what does Jerry mean? Remember the first kid? The, uh, the uh, uh, Sheer uh, Jashub means a remnant will return, and mashed potatoes and I don't know why they name their kids that. Maher Shalal Hashbaz. Here's what he means. Quick to plunder and swift to spoil. Here's what he's saying. Listen, listen here. He's going, here I am and the children whom the Lord has given me. We are a walking testimony and we don't even have to say anything. They just need to repeat our names to know that God is in control. And they're not buying it. So listen, so he says, he says, we're here as a testimony and we are for signs and wonders in Israel from the Lord of hosts who dwells on Mount Zion. Verse 19, and when they say to you, seek those who are mediums and wiz wizards who whisper and mutter, should not a people speak to their God or should not a people seek their God? Here's what he's saying, man. Everybody's going, hey, this great thing. And once again, we live in a generation of that, right? Why would you trust God's word when Chloe or whatever her name is can hell like help you out, whatever it is. You know, people are telling you to go to a different thing. Did you see, I, I'm kind of on a news fast. I was like on a total fast, but now I'm just on a news fast politically and I'm watching other stuff. Did you see like somebody came up and they changed all the Zodiac signs? That is messing with some people's heads, man. <laughs> like people are going, for reals? All this time I thought I was a Gemini and now I'm something else. Oh no. And I'm thinking, that's news? It's like, that is the craziest thing. And so listen, so and then some of you guys, you guys don't watch the news. What's the matter with you? So listen, listen, here's what he's saying. What are you doing speaking? Why, where are you going? And why are you going to wizards and mediums? And what are you doing? And he goes, shouldn't you? Do? 
Shouldn't you go to God? Shouldn't that be our answer? And that's the one they go to. And then here's what I love. He goes, listen, should not a people see, or, or, or at the end of verse 19, should they seek the dead on behalf of the living? What do you go to dead people and ask them things for when you can be talking to living people? Why are you doing that? Because we're stupid, that's why. Verse 20, to the law and the testimony, and to the testimony, He's saying that's where we need to go. We don't need to go to mediums. We don't need to go to wizards. We need to seek God, and we need to go to the law. We need to go to the testimony. And if they do not speak according to his word, it is because there is no light in them. In other words, others who are doing that, there's no light. Why would we go to darkness? They will pass through it hard-pressed and hungry, and it shall happen when they are hungry that they will be enraged and curse their king and their God and look upward. Here's the crazy thing. It's exactly what happened to Ahaz. Man. Then they will look to the earth and see trouble and darkness, gloom and anguish, and they will be driven into the darkness. Man, I read seven and eight, and it's not like real uplifting. And again, some of you may be, man, it's Thursday night. Come on, bro, I need a kind of a shot in the arm. Well, hopefully you got a punch in the arm. And you started thinking about, man, you know, because it's so, listen, it's so easy to get our eyes on circumstances, even in little things, and begin to look at those and quit trusting God, quit believing God. I, I think we should be talking to God about a lot of things. I think we should be hanging out with him as much as possible, especially if we want to be like him. You become like those you hang around, right? That's what my dad always told me. When I hang around with those guys, you're going to be like them. And their parents were telling them the same thing about me. But, you know, listen, don't, don't you be around those people. And Shouldn't we be hanging out with God? Man, and then I read this, and here's what I'm reading, and here's what I see. You got a guy like doing everything, and you got a God doing everything short of forcing someone to believe in him. He's showing them the horridness and, and uh, the results of their, their, their decisions way before they even are at that place. And God says, here's what's going to happen, man. It is coming at you, and it's coming at you strong. Are you going to trust me or not? I guarantee you, you're going to make it because I'm going to protect the line of the Messiah. Kind of brought that up in the middle. I kind of love how that's hidden in there and part of that. I'm going to protect that line, so you don't need to worry about that. And you need to quit trusting the world. I found in my life it to be so true. When I trust the world, I get a whole bunch more of the world than I bargained for. Now I got a whole bunch of the world in my life that I got to try and figure out and I got to try and deal with. And sometimes I go to God and go, why? And he goes, well, because that's who you were asking for. You see, it's a dangerous thing when we beg and beg and beg because then sometimes he gives us what we're begging for. And so in the midst of our situation, and I think we look at the world, I think we should get our eyes on Jesus. And we should get our eyes on God and the promises of God and know that, listen, Know that our God is in control. My Bible says he has the king's hearts in his hand. It's either true or not. It's either real or not. I happen to believe it's real. I happen to believe sometimes it's a little loose. Hold on to king's heart. But I believe he's got it in his hands. And I also believe just like Israel, Judah here, is getting the king they deserve. Sometimes we get what we deserve, and that's the scary part. But you know, we need to come to the place where we believe him, and in our hearts and in our lives, we want to live to glorify him. We're not going to live in fear. We're not going to be afraid of the war machines coming our way or the circumstances that seem like they're going to overwhelm us. We're going to trust God and his promises. Let's stand up and pray. Lord, tonight as we think about Isaiah and what was going on with him and the circumstances surrounding these two chapters, and Lord, so much going on, and a lot of word picture, 
And bottom line, the easiest way to interpret chapter 7 and 8 are Ahaz, Judah, Jerusalem. You need to quit trusting Assyria and start trusting God. And when you do trust Assyria, here's what's going to happen to you. It's going to be ugly. It's going to be painful. You're going to be overwhelmed. You're trusting one of the most evil empires in the world to save yourself from two people, two groups that I've got under control. So God, I pray that we would be bold enough, brave enough to come to you with our situations and circumstances. And God, I know that sometimes your ways are the most frightening and the scariest. They're hard to understand and are difficult to figure out because we have to have that element of faith. We've got to walk by faith with you. And I know from my own life and experience, walking by sight is much easier. But God, I also know that walking by sight is a short-term solution to a long-term issue that has consequences. And so I pray for myself, I pray for my brothers and sisters that we could learn to trust you. Lord, that we can learn from Ahaz and that generation. And man, trust in Assyria is never going to work. It's never going to be good for us. And that we would know and understand your heart for us, those of us who call ourselves believers, Christians. It's your heart for us is to get us to heaven. I, I believe with all my heart that you want us in heaven more than we even want to get there. And God, make that a reality in our lives and a, and a strength in our life and so that we can walk through our situations steady, strong, firm, not all unstable and waving around and, and being tossed to and fro. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.